Good evening and welcome to a new episode of Unspun. I'm your host, Mark Besant. Often branded as spin doctors, journalists are sometimes accused of twisting the facts. We want to guarantee you that we'll unspin that theory. Over the next hour, this comprehensive show will bring you up to speed with the stories that matter the most to you, our viewers. We're digging deep to bring you investigative and special reports and to always ensure it's all factual. In this episode, we've done an in-depth investigation into a potential issue of land grabbing that has not only displaced several families, but it has pushed the relevant authorities to take notice and initiate police action that could be tantamount to fraud. Tonight, we also look at the ongoing saga into the beleaguered state entity Wasa. As senior investigative journalist Shaliza Hassan Ali, who has been following and breaking several stories on Wasa, unmasks further secrets that has befallen the state entity. So stay tuned to this riveting episode of Unspun. You know that feeling when you have an uncontrollable desire for fried chicken? That's the KFC. A substance that stimulates your senses to identify the aroma of our secret recipe or an extra crispy crunch from any distance. It's invisible to the naked eye, but you can feel it traveling throughout your body, taking control. All so you can enjoy a juicy bite of KFC. Ignite your senses with KFC. You've worked hard to get here. Financially secure, good health, and a comfortable future for you and yours. But even the best laid plans fall apart from losses due to unforeseen medical conditions and expenses. With a premier health plan from Beacon, you have access to the best preventative care and medical treatment the world can offer without sacrificing your financial security and future plans. Ask about Beacon's premier health plan and get complete health coverage that affords you better prevention, better detection, better treatment, better living. It's been a perennial problem facing Trinidad and Tobago for many years. Several persons living on state land for years have been pushed out by affluent businessmen and developers with little recourse. That very situation has been playing out as we speak in Damien Bay in Maracas over the last year when wealthy businessman Ainsley Gill and his wife Trudy Gill moved in on what is state land and claimed it to be their own after purchasing it from one of the occupants there. In this investigation, Unspun uncovered the truth about what has happened there and how the matter seems to be heading to the police with possible fraud on their radar. Here's this expose. This sprawling 11.75 acres of land sitting near Damien Bay beachfront just off the Maracas Bay is now the contention of a bitter battle. The inviting waters and picturesque view has been enjoyed by at least six occupants and their families for generations on this land overlooking Damien Bay. Collectively, the Wayne Thomas, Gemma Barrow, Celestin, Augusta Spear and Alwyn Karimboka's families have lived here for more than 150 years. The tranquility and the peace they once relished was uprooted one year ago when wealthy businessman Ainsley Gill and his wife Trudy Gill claimed they were now the legitimate owners of the land and everything on it. Gill is a CEO and director of Nyquan Energy Group based in Pointe Pere and was a former Washington DC based lobbyist under the Patrick Manning administration. Sometime last year, Work started to take place inside Damien Bay, better known as Damie, as we, the founders from before would say, would call it Damie, right? Now, when that work started to take place, a gate, we had a gate, we had a barrier there, our barrier come and removed by one Mr. Gills, came and moved the barrier and put up a gate. He acknowledged all of us who was inside here. Yeah? He sent me a key for the gate, right, after moving our barrier. Well, that gate, well, I don't know what happened. Like, he didn't like the gate or whatever with his thing, but I don't know. I don't know what transpired between them. He come and he changed the gate now 
and he put a different gate and actually locked me out. And offer me $50,000 for my property. I told them that was given to me from my grandparents and that is of sentimental value to me that have no price. Well, apparently, like, he couldn't take that. Thomas shook off offers by Gil who offered to build him a house with electricity. For Thomas, that was not practical. I cannot live under that condition when I plant all these fruit trees here. And if I have to turn up there one day and pick one fruit, I'll be stealing it. Because it will be no longer mine. It will be somebody else's. So I can't live under that condition. And I was never gained access into that property again. Gill's advances spread to the other occupants on the land. Walk us through what has happened to, to your property or what is supposed to happen to your property. Swan Inzi Gills came in there about a year ago, promised to help fix the road and develop the place that everybody will live their nights. We didn't know any better. We, as the citizens there, is who cut the road with Wendell Romain, Dario, Saban, what is his right name? Dario, I know him as Dario. Dario and all the citizens there, we put up money and we cut the road. We had the road using. We used the road for agriculture to bring in and out goods. So the St. Z. Gales came in, purchased from whoever I'm not sure, claimed that he from Dario and he claimed that he's going to help. Nobody said anything. We had a gate. <coughs> we gave him a key. That welcome him. I don't know where the, the, the turn made, where he decided to put up his own gate. He's not answering to nobody. He, put his, he brings security, put security measures. He starts putting out people from the place. The question is, what gave Gil and his wife the so-called authority to make moves to evict those living there and pave a road that had already been cut prior by the occupants and name the place and violin without proper authorization. It turns out that one of the other occupants on the land claimed he had owned the entire acreage and struck up a deal with Gill to sell for $1.5 million, according to documents obtained by Unspun, that was part of a dossier submitted to Ministry officials of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries for the construction of a grandiose eco-park in the area. When Gill supposedly secured sale of the land last year, flimsy letters with no official letterhead of any sort were sent by his wife, Trudy Gill, to many of the other occupants instructing them they must vacate the land or comply with the rules. Thomas, Augustus, Karen Bocas, Peer, Kurt Celestin, Philip Romain were among those in receipt of those letters. The letter stated that a private road was paved and access is only through a gate he constructed and limited to certain persons coming in with their personal vehicles. The first gate he constructed had the initials AG, which was quickly replaced by this electronic gate with the sign and via. The Gills contended that had purchased the land from Sabinus Constantine, also called Dario, and said that the chattel buildings together with all rights, title estate and interest in lands comprising 11.75 acres was now theirs. But there was one problem. Officials at the Land Settlement Agency told us Damien Bay was state land as outlined under the State Lands Act, which we also later checked and confirmed. Practically, Sabinus Constantine did not have any rightful ownership to the land to sell it, period. We contacted Mr. Constantine to ask if he had a deed for the land. He read our WhatsApp messages, but never responded. Nevertheless, on the 19th of September last year, according to documents, the Guild submitted to the Commission of State Lands, they supposedly purchased the 11.75 acres of land from Constantine for $1.5 million. They had earlier that year in May bought a building also on that land from Joseph Anasalam near the beachfront for $1 million, and in August, a two-level house from Anthony and Michelle Constantine for $400,000. Interestingly, in that sale agreement, it clearly indicates, the chattel building and the lands occupied by the vendor is owned by the state. 
It was from September onward last year that things intensified for those who did not comply with the guild's instructions and requests. And earlier this month, Wayne Thomas got a devastating phone call. Well, my, on the 4th of March, which is two, three Thursdays ago, my, I got a phone call stating my house is demolished. Right? And carried away. I don't know where it's where been carried away. I don't know. I know nothing about that. It's just a phone call I got that my house and pictures showing my house that demolished. Nobody never called me. Nobody never informed me about what it is taking place in, on that property because I can't gain access to the property. It's police, it's security guards, and you've been bullied. Augustus Spears experience was even more traumatic when he met people on his property recently as they marked X's on trees near the land he occupied. When they came to survey by me, I started acting up because I met them surveying. I asked the surveyors who authorized this and where is, I didn't see no kind of documents to warrant this. They said it came from Commissioner of State Land. I say, well, I was notified. I started getting on. I got up two bottles, to be honest, to think. They called security, they subdued me. The officers, one of the officers said he could shoot me because I have a weapon, that is weapon. And started kind of roughing me up. They subdued me for the silver to go on. So I really didn't have a choice. It was three of them. I didn't get a name, they wasn't given any name. Gemma was equally perturbed when she learned what happened to her possessions in her home on the land and even made two police reports with no action taken to date. I, was, I made the report that they move out everything from my house and I don't know where they put my stuff. I don't know. They move everything. And the officer in charge said that she would... Um, Send an officer up a patrol with my granddaughter and I. And I went by the gate with the police, and they never let me in. Then the security never let the police go in with me. So to this day, you don't know where your possessions are? No. No. I don't know what they did with my thing and a lot of things. A lot, a lot of things I had in my house. The electronic gate onto this land is heavily guarded and those that enter are questioned and asked for photo identification as if to suggest this is a private gated community. This is the house that Gemma Barrow once owned. She said her possessions were taken out and now it has been gutted and repaired. She still hasn't gotten answers as to where her possessions are. Barrow claimed that Gil kept telling her to get off the land, indicating he had now purchased it and was willing to give her $25,000 for the pain of it all as one of his text messages to her shows. Barrow's granddaughter challenged his claim to the land, responding via text that he needed to show a deed or a deed of comfort for the land. But that never came. What he was saying in the yes. message is that I have to leave the land. It is now his own and to vacate. Well, some say vacate, some say to leave, you know. And my granddaughter um, messaged him and said, so you're saying that my grandmother have to leave the state lands? And his reply was, talk to the commissioner of lands or dare you? That is what he said. And that um, he's putting up a gate and my only access is through him. And that is exactly what he did. He put up the gate and that is it with me. Have you been able to get access to your property at all? Not at all. When I went there, um, no, before I went, some meeting, that same peer called and he said that they're moving the things off my house. So I went to the police station. Andrea Williams, who lives with her father, Alwyn Karen Bukas on the land, took it upon herself to write directly to the Minister of Agriculture, Clarence Rambarat, in December last year as they faced mounting challenges to get in and out from their property. I would like for them to remove the gate so that we could have access. We just had to walk 
with the fish, with the ice, everything they stop us from driving on the beach. Right, they say turtle and they, they go on over there. But how we have access? I used to access through that road with my van and reach right there. Now we can't do that. On November 20th, 2020, Trudy Gill wrote to the Commissioner of State Lands, Bahamati Sicharan, indicating that she purchased 11.75 acres in Damien Bay for development of an eco park and was seeking a 99 year lease. Five days later, the Commissioner of State Lands responded, stating, The matter was forwarded to the relevant unit for investigation and you will be notified of our findings. Minister of Agriculture Clarence Rambarat told Unspun that he visited Damien Bay in October 2020 and requested the Director of Service to conduct occupancy service on the site and said he later received letters from persons claiming to be affected by the Gill's development. Rambarat said, In January 2021, I met with Ainsley and Trudy Gill and received from them a bundle of documents relating to Trudy's acquisition of state lands in Damien Bay including land I saw being occupied by other persons on my site visit in October 2020. He said after the meeting on the said night, he spoke to the lawyer for Trudy Gill and the next day wrote him challenging the documents that he prepared for Trudy Gill, which she was using to claim ownership of the state land. The Land Management Division also completed a report on the matter on January 29th with accompanying pictures that Unspun also obtained. One of the things pointed out in the report was that guilds were constructing a retaining wall along the coastline using concrete and metal piles. Upon further inquiry, it was revealed that they did not possess the necessary statutory approvals for construction of the same. They were told they needed to seek necessary permission. The report also stated relevant notices should be served accordingly. Further investigation should be carried out on the seawall being constructed and other developmental works and necessary action be taken according to state land policy. And whether or not any consideration should be given to the Gill's application for the parcel of lands. In February, the Agriculture Minister was seeking clarity on what had been happening with the matter. In correspondence we obtained, it was clear from that document that Damien Bay was state land since 1943 and still remains so to date. Senior sources inside the Land Settlement Division told Unspun that based on the evidence they uncovered, Damien Bay belonged to the state and no one had any legitimate claim to sell the land. On March 10th, Commissioner of State Lands would send out a document. Despite the fact that the Commissioner of State Lands sent a notice to Mr. Gill and others to cease and desist from occupying this land here on March 24th, there was still work up once there as we came onto the site. And so work happening here with workers near the beachfront and Damien Bay. The letter stated investigations reveal that you have unlawfully trespassed onto this parcel of state land at Damien Bay North Coast Road, Maracas Bay, without any probable claim or pretense of title. Without proper documentation, legal action would be brought against the parties. While the Commissioner of State Lands was moving to act, a few days before Agriculture Minister Rambarat had written to the Gill's lawyer Zalil Shamshundin. In that letter obtained by Unspun, Rambarat addressed the concerns of the affected occupants, some of who spoke to us during this investigation, about the security gate installed that prevented them from getting to their homes. To that extent, they believe that this could amount to an act of trespass and fraud insofar that your clients, through documents you have prepared and upon which they rely, are exerting rights which they do not possess and are also denying the affected residents' rights which they may easily establish. The minister continued, The fact that the documents prepared by Yusham Shudin and company and style as chattel sale agreements are inseparable from a practical and legal sense from the land upon which these chattels sit and to the extent that those documents refer to deal with and purport to add credence to the claim of land ownership now being relied upon by the Gills, these affected persons believe that those documents and the instructions given for their preparation may constitute fraud. The minister made it clear in his letter to the Gills lawyer that he was referring the matter to the Commissioner of Police for investigation. On March 8th, Rambarat wrote a six-page letter to Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith, raising serious concerns about this matter, stating that although most of the documents bear the name Trudy Gill, he considered Mr. Ainsley Gill to be the prime mover of these transactions. 
Rambarat immediately cut to the chase as he indicated that the sale of the chattel from two of the former owners were not being contested, but rather the sale agreement between Trudy Gill and Sibidas Constantine by several of the affected occupants, who he noted had likely merit to their claims. Rambarat revealed in the letter that his checks at the Land Settlement Agency revealed that a file number referenced in the letter by Trudy Gill in November 2020 is not an LSA reference number, and the LSA was currently investigating Constantine to see if he had ever applied for a certificate of comfort. The minister making direct reference to CBNS Constantine said, To sell what he does not own is in question. The description of Sabinus Constantine as executor of the estate of his grandfather is to be proven along with the assets of that estate. This matter raises a specter of fraud and collusion. Rambarat, in the strongest possible terms, told the commissioner, I reiterate that this matter raises a specter of fraud and collusion and the possible act of land grabbing in the Demon Bay Maracas area. It raises a prospect of bullying residents whose claim, in my view, has merit by persons who appear to have wealth, power, and influence. Rambarat, in closing, said it was not a normal practice for him to get involved in a state land matter like this, but he was drawn to the matter due to the pleas of the citizens and the fact that several of the statutory bodies appear not to have acted. A few days later, Commissioner of Police in this brief letter wrote back to the minister indicating that a head of fraud squad would be in touch with his office to explore this matter further. But what did Enzigil have to say about these allegations, starting with the intimidation and bullying as alleged by Jama Barrow and many others? He sent us email responses to questions we sent him more than a week ago, preferring not to speak to us via phone or on camera. We questioned him about the alleged bullying and intimidating and the use of security with automatic weapons that we saw firsthand. He claimed that he had not bullied or intimidated any occupants and in response to both items, he categorically said that security does not bully occupants nor carry automatic weapons. He said, what you believe you may have seen is a security officer with his pistol in a micro-stabilizer Ronnie kit. This Ronnie kit accepts pistols and are designed to provide added utility and attaching it to your pistol is perfectly legal and your pistol does not make it into an automatic weapon. Four other witnesses who sat in the van with this investigative journalist, including an experienced security officer, all concurred the man was carrying an automatic weapon when we were able to briefly get into the compound. Because the security guard advanced on us so quickly, we couldn't chance taking a picture to aggravate him. When asked about the letter to cease and desist from occupying the land, that unspun confirmed from senior officials at the Land Settlement Division that was sent to Gill and many others, Gill responded in a very technical manner. The letter you refer to March 10th is not addressed to me nor to my wife, Trudy Gill. We asked Mr. Gill if he was aware that Sabina Constantine did not own the 11.75 acres in Damien Bay, which was in fact bona fide state land, and he had no authority to sell it to him. He responded, We agree that no one has the authority to sell state land, save and accept the state. Note, we did not purchase any state land from Mr. Dario Constantine. What we purchased, further to legal advice from Mr. Dario Constantine, was a chattel balance together with all rights, title, estate, and interests he may have. At best, Gill's comments are ironic since Constantine declared he was selling what he termed his land of 11.75 acres. Officials of the Land Management Division said Gill may own the chattel building, but the land remained the state's. Did Gill have any intentions of vacating the land following the instructions given to all occupants on the Demon Bay land by the Commissioner of State Lands? Gill contended, We have submitted an application for preservation of state lands to the Commissioner of State Lands and they are awaiting a review and the determination of the application. Again, we do not know who officials you are referring to, but we advise that the authority to adjudicate matters on state land is the Commissioner of State Land. Gill knew well enough direct reference of the officials was the Commissioner of State Lands from previous questions. Gill was asked to respond to the alleged illegal retaining wall he was constructing along the beachfront at a cost of $1.4 million. That the Land Management Division report said they had no statutory approval to build. He said that he was not aware of the report, nor of any notice served accordingly. He also indicated, that being said, that the retaining wall is now complete and is now preventing land slippage into the sea. Of course, when we visited, works were still ongoing contrary to Gill's statement. Gill was questioned about whether he had plans to compensate the occupants he had distressed and allow them back onto the lands. 
His ironic response was, we do not have any authority to give access or move anyone off the state lands. The authority to do so is the Commissioner of State Lands, and I believe this question should be addressed to that office. But clearly, based on the evidence provided earlier by occupants, Gil had sought to deny many of them access to the land and their homes. Gil said he acknowledged the letter by Minister Rambarat sent to his lawyer about a possible criminal investigation that may constitute fraud. He said while he had no claim to the state land, he chastised the minister for defending people like Jemma Barrow and Kurt Celestin, who also had no claim to the state land, and then further uses this basis to accuse his lawyer that his advice may constitute fraud. Gill claimed he had done everything above board and with transparency, and claims they improved the quality of life in Damien Bay for the residents there. Gill shot back at Minister Rambarat, saying he was attempting to preempt the investigation of the statutory bodies and warned the minister to thread carefully in one of his responses to us. He said, The Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries efforts also attempts to pass legal judgment on our learned lawyer, the famous Mrs. Gill, a very kind and endearing person, and myself, a business person and owner of energy company as persons with illegal or malicious intent. These issues we take very seriously, and we kindly ask the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries to refrain from such action. Gill was even questioned about claims by the occupants who provided us with photographs of police vehicles and police officers offering security. He claimed police officers were engaged and paid by us using the normal and legal extra duty arrangements approved by the Commission of Police and were visible on the property and once we installed a security gate, they were replaced with private security. Perhaps Wayne Thomas summarizes quite aptly the situation. What kind of redress are you seeking um, following this situation now that you, are being, you have been placed in? Well, for somebody in authority to come forward and do the right thing. I, am, I don't have no problem if, if the gentleman acquired the land the right way. I am free. I, I, I'm being an honest man, right? I told him flat I don't want his money, right? And I still don't want his money. You understand? But justice needs to be done for what it is taking place. Many of these occupants say they applied in the past for deeds of comfort, but were still waiting. They were hoping for serene waters at the end of this tumultuous battle, with many of them being able to once again live on the land they have only known as their home. Just to bring you an update on that story, late Wednesday night, apparently Ainsley Gill claimed that one of the homes that he purchased was damaged by fire. He's saying that people in the area there who are conducting illicit activities apparently attacked the house and tried to burn it down. Don't go anywhere. Up next on Unspun, Shaliza Hasnali unmasks more secrets in the underbelly of Wasa. Welcome back to Unspun. The shocking revelation contained in a recent subcommittee's report into the operation of the Water and Sewage Authority has put the beleaguered state entity under intense scrutiny by Public Utilities Minister Marvin Gonzalez. It was concluded by the committee that a dysfunction in Wasa ranged from bad management, overstaff, mounting debt, loss of revenue and corruption, which have been deeply entrenched in the cash-trapped organization. These pressing issues have led Wasa to not satisfy its customers' demands for water nor achieve the state's mandate. It was agreed by the committee and cabinet that the only practical solution lies in the incremental dissolution of Wasa and replace it with a water management company. Let's take a look at senior reporter Shaliza Hassan Ali on Masks, Wasa Secrets.
For years, the Water and Surge Authority's high wage bill, unreliable water supply, culture of corruption, and mismanagement had been on the radar of several governments. Wasa had been like a runaway horse that bolted from its stables. But the state entity's involvement in nepotism, corruption, political patronage, poor management, bad spending, and inefficiencies came to a halt last month after a damning report of the Cabinet subcommittee highlighted its lingering failures and spiral of decline. That report, laid in Parliament a few weeks ago and referred to a joint select committee for further examination, branded WASA a breeding ground for corruption and an unproductive organization. The latest of those that Unspun uncovered dealt with its managerial staff and the plan to reduce its top-heavy management. There's uncertainty as to how many of the 426 managers on WASA's payroll will be affected by this decision in the coming days. The impending move to decrease managers is all part of WASA's pressing the reset button, says Public Utilities Minister Marvin Gonzalez. Of course, yes. I, I, I would not um, mince words to say that um, there wouldn't be a shake-up. There must be a further shake-up. A managerial? Managerial shake-up. You, you cannot move forward with a management team with 426 managers. <coughs> it, it's untenable. It's unworkable. <coughs> when, we in, when, when, when we interviewed some of the senior executives in Wasa, they complained about this, that structure. As a matter of fact, they told us in no uncertain terms that the management structure is unworkable and has contributed to the deterioration of the organization. In 1999, Cabinet Structure on Wasa called for four levels of leadership and a complement of 172 managers. However, its top-heavy staff allows for duplication of functions and structural fragmentation. There must be cuts to the manager level. You, you need to streamline what currently obtains to ensure that you have proper management in place and holding people accountable. The, 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 the present levels, you're talking about eight management levels within the organization. The report stated that WASA's executives are not held to account, deploy very little controls, are not effectively regulated, apply very antiquated technology-deficient systems and are generally devoid of an understanding of WASA's rule. The decision to trim managers falls in the hands of WASA's executive director, Dr. Lennox Seeley, and chairman of a special cabinet subcommittee, Penelope Beckles Robinson, who were mandated to implement recommendations to turn around the cash strap company. Gonzalez said many of the managers held three-year contracts, which ended in 2016. And even though they are now on month-to-month -month contracts... They're getting bonuses, and they're holding substantive positions within the organization. So, so that is the, the nightmare that, that we've discovered in the organization. In addition, Gonzalez revealed that hundreds of unqualified individuals were hired at the authority under the People's Partnership Administration. Some workers were brought in without identification cards. Others never signed a contract outlining their job description, and many paid hefty bribes to secure jobs. So persons were illegally brought into the organization receiving a salary, not being qualified for these positions. But I'm, I've also received anecdotal um, information that a number of those persons paid to be employed within the organization up to $15,000 $15, to be employed within the organization, paid persons within WASA to be employed within the organization without having the requisite qualification. In a sense, there are a number of managers who um, are employed in management positions not in alignment with their own qualifications. So the whole thing is in disarray. The whole thing is upside down. WASA has 4,828 employees, while its required strength is 3,000. 
Gonzalez also accused some politicians of supporting wrongdoing. Because you see, to fight and to deal with the Wasa problem, you need to have the credibility to tackle Wasa. And if you don't have the credibility to tackle Wasa, it is going to defeat you. So you have to be laser focused on the issues. And you have to be prepared to, to lay blame where blame is rightly due. And I also lay blame um, and cast blame to a lot of politicians who played the game by getting people inside of the organization who they damn well knew were not qualified to take up some of these positions. The only reason why they are in the organization is because of their political allegiance. And they are not doing what they are, they are, they are being paid to do. And some of these problems, some of these people and some of these employees are some of the worst employees within the organization because they believe that they got there because of the support of politicians and therefore they should remain there. Also of concern in the report was unions providing goods and services to the authority. This led Public Services Association President Watson Duke to admit that his wife's firm Blackstone Engineering Technologies Limited had been the recipient of several WASA contracts. Between 2014 to 2020, WASA paid Blackstone's engineering $9.8 million. The company is still owed millions of dollars. Recently, there have been calls from different quarters for Duke to step down. Gonzalez said the committee found that WASA had an unhealthy and incestuous relationship with its unions. There are no checks and balances in place, and therefore decisions are being made or were made that were in, were rather against the best interests of the authority, um, that constituted, as far as I'm concerned, a breach of the fiduciary responsibilities that uh, members of management sh ought to have with the authority, as well as undermining the public's interest. That incestuous relationship led Gonzalez to believe that some of WASA managers had... They sold out to the union. They sacrificed the efficiency of the organization to the unions. Senior levels of management are represented by the unions. Questioned if other unions were beneficiaries of lucrative contracts, this was Gonzalez's response. Yes, they are, they are. The provision of these contracts have been a conflict of interest, Gonzalez said. Because everybody was just eating food and everybody was just having a good time. It was just absolute wildness taking place in the organization against the interests of the people of this country and costing this country millions of dollars. On the heels of the subcommittee's report came another shocking document. An internal audit compliance report involving a senior WASA manager who was accused in 2016 of several allegations of misconduct. One allegation involved the manager misleading WASA and cabinet to reduce staff on the condition of a $367 million Inter-American Development Bank loan granted for a visa package. To the government's surprise, WASA's staff increased and its overall salary cost jumped from $130 million to $157 million. In 2017, the manager was fired but was left untouched. Why wasn't civil action taken against him? Why wasn't this matter referred to the Trent Tobago Police Service back then? Because the report has been in existence since 2016. Again, it points to the governance and management problems within the organization, so you can connect the dots. Even though the four-year period in which WASA could have taken civil action against the manager had lapsed, Gonzalez disclosed they are now looking at their legal options. The report also found that WASA paid $1.1 million in overtime to six PSA officials between 2013 and 2016, while union officials of the NUGFW also collected retroactive payments of foregone overtime of $726,000. It was also discovered that vehicles 
paid for by WASA, were assigned to union officials and employees who collected traveling allowances. A case of double dipping. Where are the monies going? They are going towards some of these illegal things that are happening within the organization. Wasa Gonzalez said, went on a spending spree with no accountability. Every year, the government pumps $2.5 billion into Wasa with no financial returns. It was also unearthed that Duke, in a letter dated October 21, 2014, requested payment of additional commuted overtime hours to an industrial relations manager at Wasa, who is also a senior PSA member. But you have to speak the facts and you have to speak the truth. That's my oath of office. A lot of these arrangements um, came into being between 2010 and 2015. All right? Um, even those collective um, agreements that were signed, you will be surprised to know that those payments that you're referring to are payments that your collective bargaining agreements did not cater for, you know. So they were made outside of the collective bargaining agreements, the vehicle allowances, the overtime payments. Those sweetheart deals, Gonzalez said, were stopped by the previous board. Former PSA General Secretary Nixon Callender said what has been going on at WASA appears to be a chaotic arrangement. We cannot have um, union leaders making um, behind-the-door arrangements for, for certain liked representatives or not. That individual is on full time off. And that individual works at the PSA, not WASA at the same time. Calendar said while commuted overtime is a fixed allowance, Duke's request for excessive overtime raised serious questions. Where is the justification for that? And you cannot say that the person is doing extra work for WASA and the PSA. Um, the, the, the essence of the commuted overtime is for you to perform duties relating to work. Calendar said... This goes against WASA's policy. He said WASA's management and the unions must hang their heads in shame for allowing WASA's state of affairs to spiral out of control. It is worrying. The PSA cannot stand on any ethical ground. And therefore the PSA has tarnished itself. And therefore I would certainly want to see the outcome of this based on some sort of investigation and let us see where the chips fall but certainly it is, an, it is embarrassing and it is shameful for the PSA specifically for the PSA. Guardian Media reached out to Duke regarding the October 2014 letter requesting overtime payment to the industrial relations manager and PSA member. However, Duke read the message but failed to respond. Thanks so much for joining us here on this edition of Unspun. We hope to see you in two weeks from now when we're hoping to bring you a fresh batch of stories that matter to you. Now remember, if you have any story tips for Unspun, please ensure you drop us an email at unspun at cnc3.co.tt or call us at 800-CNC3. Until then, have a good one, and remember, be the change you want to see in the world.